Hey there. Dave Politis, Can-Am Missing Project. Copyrighted edition for our YouTube page. And we're here on the North Fork of the Flathead River. And it's about 70% uh, of what it should be during this time of the year. And that's a concern for a lot of people. But there's a beach here. It's an idyllic setting. Usually there's a lot of people hanging out and probably within the next hour there will be. So hang on because it'll get crazy. So today what we're going to talk to you about, I got my head on a swivel here because uh, this is bear territory, but uh, talk to you about a few updated cases. First case I want to talk to you about that's updated is I did a video on a young man named Jordan Nader who disappeared in British Columbia at Manning Provincial Park. There will be a link here under the uh, description of the video for Jordan's case that I already did. He disappeared under highly strange circumstances. I talked to a search and rescue coordinator about the case and uh, they said it was odd. A uh, big snowstorm hit the area just as he was, he had disappeared. His parents came out, big search, didn't find anything. Here's the strange, even more strange part. 25 years old, disappeared October 12, 2020. On July 4th, a volunteer searcher found his uh, backpack 100 meters off a known trail. They brought in more search and rescue and his body was found 2.9 kilometers up a steep drainage, about uh, two kilometers away from where his backpack was found. This is what his dad said. It's unbelievable the amount of distance that he traveled to try to survive and get out. I have a tough time with the whole story. And uh, once you see the video I made about it, coupled with the fact that it's found way off trail, his body's up at a very limited use, and that was the description, limited use drainage. Uh, very, very sad story. Now, we're gonna get into uh, some of the letters here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand off to the side and read to you so you can have this view all to yourself. How's that? And it's a pretty curve in the river right here. So it says, uh, I've been a longtime follower and listener of yours for about a decade. I research missing persons cases and since I do that in my spare time, I wanted to have good mentors and heroes and I look up to you as definitely a man I look, have looked up to for a long time. I'm a 40-year-old man who has a bachelor's in theology from a Catholic university. I converted to the Catholic Church in 2013 after I got out of the army in 2008. After being in the infantry, I really had trouble adapting to life again. I am now a CNA and am in nursing school. Congratulations. I've been clean for over five years. One of the most important things I had to do in my process of getting on the right track was dive into my higher interests in a healthy way. I had to have a relationship with my higher power, get my education, get my therapy. And one of my interests, why I'm telling you all this is because following your research has been a significant part of my life. I believe it's significant and very important in a lot of people's lives and your work saves lives. I don't know if you know sometimes how important your work is. If it saves one life, it's worth it. I agree. If it saves many, like I know it does, it's worth more than I can explain, so thank you. Every minute you spend working counts. After I found out Ben passed on, I figured something out. Even though I'm 40, I've always looked up to you like a father figure. I have a good dad, but he has always had a certain stigma about me for some reason and let that get in the way of our relationship for no good reason. But I was always able to come to your books, documentaries, videos, and content and connect a community type way. I feel that we are a family and you are a leader. The head of the family. It doesn't make sense for people that are not as educated as the head of the family or leader to criticize or say negative comments. You are ours. So I would ignore all negative comments and negative criticisms. Your mentor, whoever that is, is the one who approximately and appropriately tells you constructive criticism. Okay, moving on. Same letter. 
I've been a person that can sense evil. Even if I don't actually see anything out of the ordinary, my brain and body will alert me. Let me elaborate. In the summer of 2020, I lived in a quiet neighborhood. It would be easy during the day, but would get greatly quiet at night. At the time, I was still smoking cigarettes and did not smoke in the house. I'm a night owl and didn't work till 9 a.m. Central Time, so I usually went to bed around 1 or 2 a.m. I would smoke out front and notice that during the summer, none of the neighbors came outside until after 11 p.m. I didn't think much of it at the time. This is a mid-sized city in northwest Iowa, population 120,000. Then if I went outside to smoke or let the dog out to pee, I just have to have him with me after midnight. The dog is a chocolate lab, 80 to 90 pounds. He would stand guard watching the tree line, not making a sound. Eyes wide, tail still, hair standing on end, dog owners, this means something's not right. Again, if I went outside any time after midnight, my body and brain was on full alert. I felt very uneasy. I didn't know what was wrong because I saw nothing out of the ordinary. But then I remembered I heard no insects at the time. That is something I remembered from the missing 411 content. Every night, every time after 12 midnight, I became anxious. I started not wanting to go outside. Smokers and former smokers know this is hard. I still went out though. I always wanted the dog to go with me. Then one night in August 2020, I felt the unusual feeling. It was about 1 a.m. on a Friday when I went outside and saw a black shadow-like figure in the yard in the house diagonally across the street from me. It was in the form of a human. Kind of looked like it had a cloak or a robe on. It moved very fast dashes and came towards me. Then I almost fell off the porch. I was so startled. Then nothing was there and the insects came back. I went inside. I haven't been in that area since I moved and I have quit smoking. I can continue to feel uneasy if I'm around anything supernatural or evil. Thanks for everything you do, Dave. So, I read that for a good reason. And the good reason is I want people to start listening into that inner voice that you have. And it's important. Why is it important? Because it's going to save your life one of these days. Just like this man said, he felt uneasy going out there, but he still kept going out. Now, dogs are an early warning device to us, and dog owners know this. They sense, they hear, they feel, they smell things way before we do, and that's important. And they hear and smell on different levels than us, so you can't even compare. I appreciated the letter, thank you. Next letter, and yeah, it's, it's hot out here today. It's a perfect day to be at the River Beach. I'll try to keep these paragraphs short, but I understand even if it gets skimmed over given the number of emails you get every day. I know you are deliberate, deliberate about not speculating on the cause behind these disappearances. A fact that you and I greatly admire, a, great, a fact about you that I greatly admire and consider to be a crux of your credibility to those who are newly introduced to your work. That being said, only a few ideas have ever really occurred to me about what might make someone commit to the behavior exhibited by so many of the missing persons that you've discussed. One is the Aaron Hedges case. After the point of separation, the victim hears a voice in their head. Obviously, anyone that hears the term hearing voices immediately thinks psychotic. But I wonder if many people have ever asked themselves what they would do if one day, clear as a bell, they heard the voice of a total stranger speaking in their head, or perhaps worse, heard the voices speaking into their ear. If they, like you and I, knew that they weren't crazy, but also knew that they heard the voice. So, first of all, Aaron Hedges, there's no proof he heard a voice, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> I've uh, done videos where people have said, hey, I hear something, and nobody else around them does. Do I think people are crazy because of that? No, I don't think just because of that you're crazy. In fact, I do think some people hear things others don't. Back to the letter. I think if one were out in the wilderness alone and vulnerable and found themselves in that situation, that they would have two options. Let me stop here. Aaron Hedges' case was in Missing 411, The Hunted. You could watch it online. The link will be on this uh, video. And Aaron was a hunter who disappeared in Montana in the Crazy Mountains. And we did an extensive segment about that case where we interviewed search and rescue and the sheriffs. 
Back to the letter. One, comply and initiate a dialogue. Or two, get the hell out of there. Perhaps, perhaps it's the case that one choice offers no better chance of survival or being found than the other, and that running only hastens whatever series of events that leads to an inexplic inexplicable undressing, veering off course, etc. That characterizes many of your cases. In the incident of those that flee, it stands to reason that someone hearing the disembodied voice of an entity that is pursuing them through the wilderness would have the same bright idea as another one of your mailbag riders did run into the creek or the body of water to better see the approach of an invisible but undeniably present pursuer. For those that choose to comply in a, situa in a situation like that and begin communicating with whatever is speaking to them telepathically, I can only assume it would lead to greater and greater sense by the victim that whatever force they have encountered is one that cannot be contested. It has the power to demonstrate its presence but never show its physical form and perhaps impose a deep sense of dread through environmental manipulation discussed in so many of the write-ins. The immediate area becoming completely silent and inexplicably dark for the location and time of day. Aaron Hedge's case is the one that really makes me wonder about the plausibility of the phenomena that I'm trying, perhaps unsuccessfully, to convey or explain, or at least something resembling it. The discovery of Hedge's backpack at the tree line overlooking the rancher's property, along with his jacket and thermos filled with an energy drink, would lead most to conclude that Aaron Hedges simply didn't want to be found. In the event of a scenario like what I've described, though, I believe it's possible that Aaron believed that he could not and should not take with him to the rain's home, the rancher's home, what had followed him or led him through the woods over the days or weeks that he remained alive after going missing. So. Hedges is found after traveling miles through the woods with no shoes. An impossible feat in the minds of many of the searchers. Because there was six inches of snow on the ground, he was walking over shale that would have cut the heck out of your feet. A lot of major assumptions here that are hard to overcome and even harder to understand. Um, I understand what the writer's saying, but uh, I'll go on. Another possibility comes to mind that might explain why Aaron didn't walk down the mountain to safety that day, which is inspired by a, a ride in which the person was chased through the woods on the way to the neighbor friend's party in a field. They explained that upon reaching the site where the party was supposed to be in progress, it was dark and empty. But that whatever had chased them there had stopped. Within the hour the victim had returned home and called a friend at the party who promptly picked them up and drove them to the party that they swore they had been going for hours already in the same dark and empty field the victim had been chased. Was Aaron the victim of the same phenomena the day overlooking the rancher's property? Only fooled into believing that before him lay not the rancher's property, but rather an empty and unpromising valley like so many he had hiked through in the days and weeks prior. P.S. Although I've become aware of your work only recently, hopefully you'll be glad to hear that I've since <clears throat> been telling all my family and friends about it as much as they'll let me, especially my sister who hikes and camps frequently in Colorado. The night I told her about it, we sat up researching and pricing out a personal located beacon for her. But my hope is to surprise her with a sat phone with a built-in PLB for Christmas. Good gift. So. Everyone knows I am a 20 year police officer and I have many, many police officers, forest rangers, park rangers. You guys have written to me all along. And man, I greatly appreciate it. I, I like hearing from you men and women all the time. <coughs> and right now, police officers are having one heck of a tough time. Any, anybody in law enforcement is having a really tough time. There's a small segment of the world that doesn't want us in their city that wants to defund us, that wants to get rid of us. And many years ago, someone sent me this. And as a lift me up for everybody that is or who has been in law enforcement. And if you know somebody that's in law enforcement, copy this down and read it to them. It's called the police officer's prayer. The police officer stood and faced his God, which was always come to which start again the police officer stood and faced his God which must always come to pass 
He hoped his shoes were shining just as brightly as his brass. Step forward now, police officer. How shall I deal with you? Have you always turned the other cheek? To my church have you been true? The police officer squared his shoulders and said, No, Lord, I guess I ain't. But those of us who carry badges can't always be a saint. I've had to work most Sundays, and at times my talk was rough. And sometimes I've been violent because the streets are awfully tough. But I never took a penny that wasn't mine to keep, though I worked a lot of overtime when the bills just got too steep. And I never passed a cry for help, though at times I shook with fear. And sometimes, God forgive me, I've wept unmanly tears. I know I don't deserve a place among the people here. They never wanted me around except to calm their fear. If you've a place for me here, Lord, it needn't be so grand. I never expected or had too much, but if you don't, I'll understand. There was silence all around the throne when the saints had often trod, as the policeman waited quietly for the judgment of his God. Step forward now, police officer. You've borne your burdens well. Come walk a beat on heaven's streets. You've done your time in hell. Why that poem really hit me when I got it is when I was in high school, I was taking a civics class. And we each drew an assignment, go to the mayor's office, go to the firehouse, whatever. Mine was to ride along with the police officer. And I called San Jose police and I got an officer on swing shift named Gordon Silva. And I couldn't have ridden with a better officer. Uh, I think I was 17. And shift went from f uh, 3 in the afternoon till 1 in the morning. My folks knew I was riding and they said, hey, just call if you're going to be late. Well, it was about 11 o'clock and Gordon's driving back out to his shift after we had to do something downtown. And there's this guy, I'll never forget it, a guy in front of us was all over the road and Gordon goes, oh, we're going to have to pull this guy over. He looks, he looks like he's in bad shape. So we pulled him over. He was drunk driving and we take him down and going through the whole booking process with him and seeing all of it. I, uh, I didn't get home till like 2.30 in the morning and this is way before cell phones and boy, my mom and dad were really, really nervous. So, went to college. And I wanted to go to San Jose and I wanted to go to work, but they were only hiring bilingual officers at the time. So I got hired by Fremont Police. And I worked there three years until San Jose dropped their uh, bilingual requirement. And I, I went on a lateral transfer and I got hired. And uh, soon after I came out of the training program, just by the luck of the draw, Gordon and I were working the same shift. And there were several shifts where we worked a two-man car together and it was unreal. It was like a, a gift from heaven. And Gordon and I just became better and better friends through life. He was my best friend. So him, there were, there were a handful of us that were real tight. And two of us were working an off-duty job at Cost Plus Imports. They had a huge internal theft problem, so we were hired to work that. And it was a Wednesday, and I get a call from communications. I, I actually, not a call, I get a beep on my beeper. And uh, I call, and it, they said that Gordon had been shot in downtown San Jose. So uh, Paul Ayub, who's the other officer, and I go down to uh, San Jose Medical Center in downtown San Jose. Turned out that two officers were shot, Gene Simpson and Gordon. Gene was responding to a call at a business and got confronted by a man, suspicious circumstances, and the man wrestled Gene to the ground, took his gun, and killed him. Witnesses saw it, called police, 
police officer needed help. And within minutes, there were loads of officers there. And in some of the crossfire, Gordon got hit by another round and was transported to San Jose Hospital. And the doctors there, remember, I remember the guy, Dr. Gutman was his name. Guys worked unbelievably hard trying to save his life. And they went back in, I think, three different times into his abdomen. And the bullet went in under his duty belt, traveled up the back of his spine, cutting an artery next to the spine, and Gordon eventually died. And his family was from Hawaii. And I'd never met them. <coughs> but... They asked that myself and another officer go back to Hawaii for the services. And we did, and some of the nicest people you would ever meet in your life. And Vicki and Cranston Kamaka, their uncle, I mean, all those people there were just phenomenal. And I haven't seen them in years, but I think about them all the time. So, yeah, that prayer does mean a lot to me. So on to the missing people. I'll tell you about two cases, and we're going to talk about international cases, because people tend to think, ah, oh, you know, this just happens in North America. Incorrect. Step over to this side for a while now. First case involves an incident that happened in Norway. And I bet you didn't think, oh, Norway. Okay. Now, if I was in, <laughs> if I was in Europe, I probably wouldn't have to show this, but a lot of you may not know, but so Spain, France, the UK, Great Britain, Norway, way up north, gets super cold. In my hockey years, I met a lot of great hockey players from Norway and Finland. This story involves a man named Ketil, K-E-T-I-L, Ulvang, 32 years old. Disappeared October 13th, 1993 in Kirkenis, Norway, far northern Norway. And Ketil was a brother of Vigard Ulvang. And you people that follow the Winter Olympics, you'll know that uh, Vigard was three years younger than his older brother who disappeared. And Vigard, the 29-year-old, he was a hero in Norway. He won a silver medal in Lillehammer in cross-country skiing. Then he won three gold medals and a silver in Albertville. And he was one of the best cross-country skiers in the world. And in October 13, 93, Vigard was in <coughs> the Dolomite Mountains in Italy training. And Katil was a trained and certified physical therapist for the Norwegian Olympic team. And on the 13th of October, he and two other physical therapists went to a school and they were given a presentation about injuries, about how to take care of yourself, things like that. And on the way back home, uh, they were about a two hour run from home and Katil, who was an athlete himself, big athlete and a great skier too, said, hey, let me out here, I'm just gonna run home. And uh, wind was blowing real hard, and the weather looked like it was changing, but nobody, nobody cared because Katil had trained his whole life in that mountains around his city. And they let him out of the car, and he took off running cross country. Now, Vigard and Katil grew up hunting and skiing in the mountains. And Vigard later said that Katil knew every rock within 20 miles of his house because that's the ground that they covered every day of their life. Training, skiing, hunting, and they would ski and carry a shotgun everywhere. Cold was not in their vocabulary. They trained and skied and hunted in some of the coldest weather you can imagine. So it never bothered them. And they were always hunting birds. And it was described that they knew that area, or Katil knew that area, like you know your backyard. So that night he doesn't, Katil doesn't come home like he was supposed to. And his older, or correct that, his younger brother 
was at home and they were going to watch the World Cup and Norway was playing a qualifying match and Morton, his younger brother, went out, looked for him. His buddies had told him that he was running. So Morton went and put, built a big bonfire on top of one of the mountains to let his, let Cotill know where he was going and where home was. Well, at 10 o'clock that night, he still hadn't come home, so he called the police. There was a massive response. In fact, it was called the greatest search and rescue in Norway's history. And they brought in helicopters. They brought in 125 soldiers. The guard <coughs> heard about his brother and came home from Italy, participated in the search. Canines covered every inch of the mountain. Uh, helicopters crisscrossed. It snowed right after he disappeared. And Vigard said to the press, there is no way my brother got lost. There's no way. And he also said that he thought that there was some type of crime that occurred because there's no way his brother wouldn't have gotten out of there alive. Well, and there was nothing on the case for months as winter progressed. And then in June 1994, the military went back and started to fly. Yeah, you hear people in the distance there. This is a beach along the river, and it's a real popular beach. I'm lucky to have this piece here with nobody. But there's some people down the beach having fun. So in June 94, the military flew dozens of missions. And five miles off the track of where Cattell should have been running, there's a very shallow lake. And in that lake, they find Cattell in it, still wearing his red coat that he was last seen in. And the coroner stated that he might have died from hypothermia, but there was no cause, official cause, released. Cattell's body was found on a Sunday in June 1994. Three days later, on a Tuesday, Cattell's girlfriend gave birth to a son, a nine pound son. So seven months after he disappears, he's found. Important points here, and the reason this case is in here is that he's found in water five miles off track. His brother, who knew him better than anybody, said there's no way he got lost. There's no way. Remember those words. People try to rationalize away these disappearances, but it just doesn't work. So, this is a picture of Vigard, the brother that helped in the search, won multiple gold medals, super athlete. I couldn't find a picture of Cattell. But this is a picture of where the small village of Kirkenis is in Norway, completely surrounded by water. It's everywhere. Water is everywhere on land. It's around it. It's, it's a big issue there. Do I believe something unusual will happen? Heck yes, I do. You can't, you can't rationalize this away when one brother says, hey, he knew this like his backyard. This is, this is everywhere we were my whole life. So no, this doesn't happen just in North America. Let's get on to the next case. This happened in Spain, Madrid. And the man's name was Austin Bice, 22 years old. There's a picture of Austin. Super athlete, six foot five inches, 230 pounds. He was uh, attending San Diego State University International Business and he got a one-year transfer to study in Madrid at the university. Graduated from Torrey Pines High School and super smart young man, played football in high school and also played for San Diego State. On February 25th, 2011, there's conflicting accounts with this. First account says that he went out drinking with buddies in a bar. Then they went to another location. He didn't get in and he disappeared. 
Another one was is that he was drinking with buddies at an apartment. They then decided to go drinking at a bar. Once they got to the bar, Austin was too intoxicated. They wouldn't let him in. And that was the last time anyone saw him. Both accounts are similar in that he went to a bar with buddies, he was denied entry, and that was the last he was seen. Nobody said he was staggering drunk or too drunk to take care of himself. Well, when he didn't report home on the 26th, his roommates reported him as a missing person. And they started a big search. So, back to the map. Here you got Norway up here, Spain's right here. And in the middle of Madrid is the Manzanares River. It runs through the middle of the city. And officials decided that they were gonna shut down the river and drain it and look for a body. Well, 10, di 10 days after he disappears, they find Austin's body in the river. The coroner never released the blood alcohol level, but the father said he can't understand how his son fell into the river. And why is that? Well, you can look at the pictures online, they're copyrighted, so I'm not putting them on the channel. But surrounding the river near the river walk is a three foot high off the ground wall, meter wide, to ensure that you don't fall over or accidentally fall in. And there's ladders in the river in case you do fall in that you can get yourself out. A retired structural military engineer reviewed the case and said it was very puzzling about what happened. Austin's dad said he was an extremely good swimmer and an athlete and he wouldn't have just fallen in and drowned. Well, remember that he wasn't staggering drunk. People that fall into water just don't give up and drown. Nobody saw it. Nobody ever sees any of these incidents I write to you about, even though it's in the middle of a major city. So how does it happen when nobody sees it? His dad was really concerned. And he's the one that brought in the engineer and looked at the wall. And the entire thing is, is hugely distressing because this has happened at so many places. I can't tell you. Consistencies. The many times, most times the person could swim really well. Second of all, alcohol's involved. Third of all, no one ever sees them. There, nobody ever sees them anywhere near the web, river, so they don't know how they got there. Most of the time, these people are very well educated, almost always men, not only highly educated, but athletes like Austin. It's a very strange scenario that plays itself off in many parts of the world. When I wrote about Austin's case, it made me think about Ben a lot, a lot of similarities. Smart, intellect, got along well. Yeah. Anyhow, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, I appreciate you watching. I'll give you a scan of this area just because it's so beautiful. And uh, make sure you're subscribed. Please, let's, let's get this village growing in a good way. Post this on your social media. Tell your people about what's going on in the world. A lot of people don't even understand these cases because they're in another country. Unfortunately, a lot of people in America don't look at the news in other country. And uh, thank you very much for being part of our village. So. Here we go. So we're on a beach right here. And it's a perfect place to hang out, bring a little rubber boat. But uh, I, was, I was here for maybe 20 minutes before we started to film and I haven't seen a fish jump in the river today. But it's really warm. 
but there's been a lot of bugs out here as well so I don't know what's going on they should be jumping give you a little zoom here down the river thank you so much for your time and your loyalty to our channel be safe have a good summer carry a personal locator beacon tell all your friends to hike with with other friends do not hike alone have a great day